All right. Good morning, everyone, and good evening, and also good afternoon, depending on your time zone. I would like to welcome you all to this AIBD OSPU regional webinar on voicing against hunger, a bit about climate change narratives. I would like to welcome you all uh, who are representing 21 countries. And this webinar is all about SDG2, the hunger alleviation, and also the climate change disruptions as well. Uh, according to the agenda, Ms. Philomena was supposed to do her opening remarks, but unfortunately, she is a bit busy. She will be joining us later. But anyways, uh, before that, if I may ask uh, Professor Amr to... So according to the agenda, we will be having Professor Hossein Amin, uh, who will be talking about role of media in covering climate change issues. He is from Egypt. Ms. Sanuta Raghu from India, executive producer from Scroll In. He, she will be talking about theoretical learnings from COP28 to reporting from the grassroots. After that, we will be having Ms. Afia Salam from Pakistan. Her topic will be food for thought. And then we will be having a case study from Nigeria by a very renowned climate change activist, Mr. Akinbot Matthew. He will be talking about the policy advocacy through media and case studies. Ah, perfect. Dr. Amar has joined us. So I would yeah. like to welcome Professor Amar, a very renowned broadcaster from Egypt and also from Middle East, and his impact on the regional broadcasting uh, ecosystem is like on next level. I would yeah, like to thank Professor Amu once again uh, to join hands with AIBD for this webinar. So Professor Amar, over to you, sir. Good morning. Good morning uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, great to all of the distinguished, distinguished guests, wherever you are. Um, a very special welcome note to, to you, uh, Miss uh, uh, my dear friend, uh, Mirfilina, Secretary General of AIBD, uh, my dear friend, and happy to meet you again after joining your conference in Bali uh, last May. I'm really content with this uh, the joint event, starting to work together, uh, OSPO and AIBD. I'm also extending OSPO team thanks to all the eminent speakers with a special guest to Professor Hassan Amin. He is my dear friend. He's um, a genius man. He's a superman. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hassan Amin is the director of Kamal Adham Center, AUC Egypt, sharing in this important webinar. I'm looking forward for more and more events. And let us uh, wish the next uh, event would be in Ospo Academy, inshallah, in Jeddah. Time to leave, I think, now and go to the seats of the viewers and have a wonderful event, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much, Professor Amr. And now I would like to introduce moderator of this event. Uh, Dr. Himant Alam, and she is the International Cooperation Advisor to President Ospo. Uh, Dr. Himant, the great is all. Uh, good morning, everybody, and maybe also good afternoon for all of you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and participants joining us for this webinar. Let me welcome you today to this virtual journey to explore, share, and understand the challenges, the significance of the SDGs, which have been set by the United Nations for the 2030 Agenda. Well, we are having 17 goals aiming at the address of some of the world's most pressing challenges. We are now concerned with the spotlight on two pivotal goals that intertwine with the fabric of our global well-being and health of our planet. We're going to have the goal, the second goal and the 13th goal. Our experts will share their perspectives on the challenges and opportunities for achieving these goals. We'll also have some case studies for the successful initiatives and programs, which can, which are, which we are hoping that they would make a difference. 
And also, we are going to seek for action steps and plan that can contrib contribute to a more sustainable future. I think and I'm sure that working together, sharing knowledge and fostering innovation and finding solutions, we can build a better future for our for our children, for our prosperity and for our Earth, for the lovable um, planet. Everyone, I believe that everyone should have access to good food and they should live in a climate available, proper planet. We are confident at OSBU and AIB that AIBD that we are going to have a good uh, platform for communication. We are aiming and looking forwards for more collaboration. And let me give a bit of idea about the OSBO. Well, o OSBO is the OIC States Broadcasting Union. It is a specialized body of the OIC organization. It has been in since the 1975. It's aim is to connect the Islamic countries in the in a union for the media professionals and which are gov the governmental organizations of these countries. It is a professional organization aiming at training, development of media and media professional among, among these nations. We are looking forwards for collaboration with different broadcasting unions worldwide and we are actually doing this uh, this is one of our milestones in achieving our goals. I will not have so long in introducing this OSBO. We have a website. We would like you to, to all to have a look and, and also cooperate in this digital world and hoping that it is a, I mean, it's just an initial step in order to go forwards and join our efforts and work with all or, or with the available broadcasting unions for the welfare of our earth and our people. Thank you very much for this note and let us start with Professor Amin and we will have his presentation with us. Thank you very much. So Professor Hussein Amin is the central director and general editor uh, and is and has dedicated to revolutionizing global media studies. At an old academic, he shares his wisdom at conferences and universities worldwide, specializing in media systems, laws, and the dynamic Middle East. But academia uh, is just one of his platforms. He has held key roles in media structures globally, even crafting a powerful media strategy for Arab women. A trailblazer for media communication and gender studies, Professor Amin leaves an indelible mark on the world. Professor Amin, sir, the grid is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can I have my first slide, please? Sure. First, uh, please allow me to thank uh, the kind invitation by uh, the President of Visible, uh, Dr. Uh, Amr Lisi. He's a very long, uh, excellent friend who uh, his work, of course, introduces himself as one of the uh, not only uh, academics, uh, that we are very proud of, but also as one of the very unique professionals uh, and television presenters uh, that gained the global recognition. And also I extend my thanks also to AI BD for putting this platform for all the scholars to address important issues. My talk today is going to be limited to the role of media in covering climate change issues that we are all suffering from and uh, with particular reference to pe people in the uh, in the muslim world undoubtedly in the arab world next please so right now we are all talk about climate journalism what is climate journalism so important climate journalism is very important because it fulfills a unique role in covering one if not the most uh, pressing issues uh, at this time it includes coverage of the latest environmental predictions and scientific data and reporting from climate summits, conventions. And we have witnessed uh, uh, COP27, COP28, and we have examined a lot of relationship, of course, with uh, poverty and hunger. Uh, big changes are happening and uh, we uh, are 
who are people are working in the media are uh, looking into issues that uh, contribute to this uh, problem uh, some way or another. Next, please. Uh, media and climate change in Egypt and Arab countries, because you know this region um, is uh, very important uh, to me uh, as a researcher. Uh, we have looked into uh, reviewing important studies that have been uh, published in the past five years, and we have found that most of the Arab studies uh, in Arabic dealt with the framework of uh, risk coverage of environmental uh, issues are not really talking about uh, in-depth on uh, media and climate change, except for Amal Azal uh, Al Azab. And the Amal Al Azab uh, study in 2021 dealt with the journalistic treatment of this kind of issues that we are facing. And also a study of uh, Saud Matar in 2020, which examined the frameworks of press coverage and sustainable development issues. Uh, other issues that have uh, been published uh, in Arab media and society, which is uh, a journal that is uh, coming out of the Kamal Atam Center on the uh, media and the environment, uh, in the past uh, are also addressed some important issues that are some citations uh, driven from this uh, research are uh, to be found in this presentation. Uh, most of the foreign studies in English and French dealt with issues of climate change, but it focused only on the framework explaining the impact of climate change on health and environment, and it addressed the frameworks of press coverage of these climate change issues, which is good. You know, and uh, it's uh, the number of these studies are increasing on a curve, and we have found many recent reports are coming out. Uh, which makes me uh, a happier person uh, because we will look into new directions that uh, and find things uh, from these studies and maybe we can uh, draw some uh, of their conclusions uh, and uh, try to apply it in uh, in our countries. The lack of Arab studies dealt with the frameworks of press coverage changes. The only study that dealt with the framework uh, of, uh, is very limited and that's why i will find in in, uh, in the conclusions that uh, you know we need some uh, dedicated journals in the field of climate change and uh, with specific reference to issues of poverty and hunger uh, maybe special issues in this topic and uh, uh, if uh, uh, the organizers of this platform find this uh, conclusion uh, legitimate then I may be take uh, may uh, propose that uh, our media and society journal, which is a, an international well recognized journal, to be taking this uh, as uh, a task maybe for the next year. Next, please. Uh, media and climate solution journalism, which is something very new, and we are uh, trying to address this as a mini uh, diploma. In, uh, at the American University, climate solution journalism needs to be presented by the journalist when writing solution uh, journalism reports. One, we need to address this. One, what evidence, which field of experience or data indicates the solution effective? What insights of information from the story would help other stakeholders better respond? Uh, to the problem, what are the limitations of the shortcomings or the potential solution proposed being questioned? Uh, and what is the outcome? The categories that uh, could provide solution include governmental entities, uh, of course, this is one of the audience, uh, companies and businessmen, civil society organizations, scientists and researchers, stakeholders, and finally, citizens. Thank you. Next, please. Compelling uh, storytelling of climate stories, which is something also very recent after COVID, we start looking into issues of uh, climate change. Uh, but how to present it to the the audience? Uh, and you, you know, uh, readership decline in most of the uh, print media, uh, whether. Uh, Newspapers, magazine, uh, 
uh, in the Arab region, but uh, television still uh, have a significant audience, uh, and this audience is shared, of course, with uh, social media. So, uh, how to present to the people and keep them interested in our uh, work uh, with regard to climate uh, stories, and they tied it up with hunger and uh, poverty. Uh, this is going to be formulating and uh, would be by formulating an attractive titles, writing a narrative entry or sharing with by uh, quote, simplifying and examining any specialized terms and making the story humane and making sure to correct it uh, to people's daily lives. Uh, connected, not corrected, I'm sorry, so connected to uh, people's daily lives and using numbers of studies to serve story and presenting them in an attractive way. Uh, you know, this is a package, of course, does not include, uh, this package does not include every single item of uh, making, uh, you know, uh, the program effective but it has to do with appeals and the major appeals that we are uh, for the public as general public uh, should be different from those who are target audience of specific age group uh, uh, and uh, also could be uh, of minor appeals that has to do with uh, using comedy or uh, drama. Or... There are so many appeals that we can make it out of make it uh, 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 cultivated in the package so that we not only attract the uh, or the target audience but also we will include part of the general audience so the appeals will will make us uh, at least have the uh, attention uh, of the people not only for a uh, few seconds, but maintaining, uh, the question is maintaining uh, the attention of the general audience to a longer period of time so that we can get our messages across. Next, please. Uh, some arrangements uh, uh, for media coverage of climate uh, and climate change, we have to prepare a plan, what we would like to do, uh, and then uh, what we will focus on in this uh, particular, what is our message and communicate with the now publishing uh, platforms and send the proposals and uh, previous communication with the sources and arranging uh, for meetings and then joining journalist groups uh, for support and exchange information and prepare the necessary information background. This all are requirements. Uh, this also does not uh, uh, overall uh, include all the numbers of the arrangements that should be done. Uh, however, these arrangements uh, we are right now are confirming with other uh, media channels and really trying to bring them to work with this, with the journalists uh, and hope for uh, finding uh, a way of uh, through the, uh, the preparation of workshops uh, with these channels to uh, make the journalists or television journalists in this case more prepared for uh, the media coverage of climate change in Egypt. Next, please. The role of media and climate change. Of course, the relationship with media and climate change uh, is of a, a special nature. And this is uh, when we um, uh, compile it with, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the goals on uh, poverty and hunger, I think that we have really a composite uh, problematic uh, issues that needs all the cooperation and coordination of different countries in the world. It's not only limited to one country, but the, 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 the cooperation between countries should help uh, and, uh, and really uh, ease this uh, composite uh, problem uh, and uh, hopefully find a way of getting out of it. However, the media rule is not uh, is not at its best in many countries 
in what is defined as a developing world. But uh, uh, the media is really asked to perform at least uh, of a minimum standards so that the, 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 the people are aware of what is uh, the climate change is going to uh, cause and uh, what are the defenses or solutions for it. So common findings, climate journalism studies that I have reviewed, and uh, I still have a lot of studies to review, that the low level of climate awareness among the different groups of community members, you know, people are not aware, especially in rural areas, the lack of strong relationship between uh, social and economic levels of climate awareness. Three most officials of the ministers in the ministries officials in the ministries and here I'm talking about ministries for information or equivalent uh, if we have a media regulators uh, or the uh, research institutions Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment uh, and the uh, Ministry of Water Supplies all of this is concerned with implementing environmental legislations uh, on uh, awareness but what what's the outcome? I see a lot of uh, information coming separately from different ministers, ministries, but I don't see the coordination that, you know, three or four ministries, they come together and put us uh, for us a plan that uh, have uh, direct uh, uh, contribution to change. Uh, and fourth uh, and final thing is the Arab media do not really fully play its educational role in spreading climate awareness. Uh, this is, uh, again, is based on the expert review uh, that been done uh, two years ago uh, on uh, the fulfillment of Arab media uh, of its role regarding climate awareness. But this is, again, was at the beginning of the, 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 the COP27 in Egypt and then COP28 in the United Arab Emirates. And, and therefore, I, I think that uh, there were some uh, significant change in the role of the Arab media. But this is to be measured. Next, please. We have, uh, you know, uh, in Egypt, some efforts to deal with climate change issues. Uh, and this has been done in uh, COP27. Uh, the raising of public awareness, and this is, again, through different uh, uh, institutions, uh, mainly uh, radio and television, when they utilize drama or the terms infotainment and uh, edutainment revived again, uh, helping capacity building, developing policies and uh, programs necessary to adapt to climate change in all sectors, of course, or activating participating uh, participation programs of association of non-governmental organizations, five exchange information reach, <clears throat> the deal dimensions for exchange of information to reach the real dimensions of the phenomenon in climate environment uh, repercussions. And six, uh, cooperating with the international community uh, through uh, the, uh, the very limited uh, international channel, channels outside uh, in preserving the quality of uh, the environment. We have an ITV international, this is one. Uh, uh, English, uh, French uh, channel that is carrying a very uh, limited amount of information about this particular uh, uh, topic. Next, please. Thank you. And here is a European effort with the issue of climate change. This is again key preliminary findings of the European Broadcasting Union. Uh, uh, facts are not done, uh, fact alone don't help. The more facts are not necessarily more uh, 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 convincing, and this is one of the lines that are important. So we need to keep covering and reporting about what's really happening as facts. Uh, um, uh, the old programs is trying to make the problem look very tiny, small problem, but we they don't report facts because they they feel that the public opinion is going to be. Uh, uh, negatively uh, uh, infected with the uh, with with this with this kind of facts, messenger is often more important than the message. It is 
a matter of credibility with the audience. Of course, the messenger is uh, is important, but the message it should be most important. This is what we uh, can do uh, the change. Uh, however, you know, they usually as celebrities and celebrities, they are tied up with uh, with with uh, a kind of journalism that is not necessarily serious journalism. Uh, so all the celebrities are movie stars, and uh, there are a lot of questions. So the, the question of credibility is not there. Maybe they can endorse an ad of a product, but when it comes to uh, advising uh, common people, I think it's, it's going to be difficult. It is important to make climate impact part of all the beats of the news rather than a confined it to dedicated journalists and th this is it's a given uh, it's uh, i don't have to comment on it uh, there is no uh, one size fits all models of course people are different uh, different approaches for different people different messages for different groups and therefore uh, the people who, who would really think that that one message uh, is for all people, they're making a mistake. Images matter a lot. Of course, as they, uh, they, there are the, the pictures, they carry information. This, inf this information is, is incredibly containing uh, one image containing lots of uh, lots of information. This information is not measured, will not be, we will not as a researcher be able to measure the details of this particular picture because it's unrealistic to describe a picture uh, in terms of the details because we cannot. Uh, it carries thousands and thousands of thousands of information that are not uh, or could, could not be lend itself to uh, interpretation uh, through written words or uh, even spoken words. And pictures usually uh, bypass time and space. That's why uh, photojournalism uh, is very important with regard to uh, climate change. It takes us to places and introduces us to people. And uh, there, therefore, it's uh, it, it bypassed time and space. I don't think any article can do that. Media had a hard time in uh, living up to their own standards, which comes, of course, with media do do have their own problems. So uh, again, the media regulators in a particular any media channel they do have. Uh, uh, you know, to keep the minimum requirements of uh, the all the standards. I'm not going to repeat it. There are so many of them. Uh, and measuring. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the, the important thing is to keep doing the minimum uh, uh, and don't compromise the quality uh, and keep the standards. Uh, and they keep the international standards because this is very important. We have seen a lot of uh, media channels losing their uh, their positions and also uh, losing their uh, credibility. Uh, there is a lot of materials to put out there, but how to communicate climate change is successfully? My big question. Of course, I, I'm, I'm not going to claim that you know uh, uh, we have. Uh, Many of the uh, of the people who are communicating the message are uh, popular, but I will be biased today and say my friend Amri Lisi is a professor in, in 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 communicating this kind of messages, and his program reaches to the poor, uh, and he gained a lot, uh, and put himself in uh, in a position. It's either to be number one all the time or not to be which is uh, uh, a difficult position. I don't want to be in, in his position, but he's doing an ex extraordinary work. Uh, uh, thank you. This is enough for this slide. Can I move to the next one?
want to keep the time. Uh, in conclusions, studies reveal a number of issues increasing media rule. But one is, of course, we have found that no academic interest in developing a climate journalism courses in academic programs in journalism mass communication. Oh, well, strange. I did not examine this in, in I examined this in the Arab world, uh, Arab world ca countries. But I didn't example in the Islamic world. But I have a feeling that this is not is not going to be a strange finding if I do examine. I don't know why, but uh, I think I need to examine it to give to have some sort of input uh, over here to see the role of media with climate change issues because it's going to have a credible impact on issues of hunger and issues of poverty. Limited interest in climate journalism from the media channels, even until now. You know, when we talk uh, in open uh, in, uh, 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 conferences or even in small groups and uh, forums, uh, we, we don't see uh, really the, the people are very interested in, in, in the owners of media channels uh, have a great interest. Uh, in, in covering these issues, you know, they, they didn't think that it will bring audience uh, like uh, uh, sports, uh, a soccer game or uh, or uh, an entertainment uh, party or whatever, you know, they go to entertainment uh, is really shaking the, 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 the approach of uh, developmental journalism. Uh, so, uh, media and development that was in the in the sixties, seventies, and even the eighties uh, is not. You don't see an. Uh, you don't see. You, you see everywhere people are uh, looking for entertainment, uh, for music, for. Uh, so again, uh, we need to think uh, through a new model of using music and. Uh, and uh, entertainment programs to be able to reach to the people and cultivate in with uh, the issues that are going to affect their lives. Uh, superficial media coverage uh, of climate change issues, um, even the ones that we have, it's in my book, it is uh, superficial, you know, it's not touching uh, the, the deep into, into the problems that we're facing. And I don't want to list the problems, there are serious problems uh, that uh, in Egypt we have to deal with. And then uh, public awareness in climate change, uh, limited public awareness, uh, we have mentioned that in the uh, early slides, limited int uh, interest from the press, and this is also uncovered, limited numbers of conferences, forums, and symposium. I hate to say it, but I am presenting in one of the wonderful forums, uh, 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 and this is bringing scholars from different parts of the world to talk about important issues, but we need more of this. We need more of this, you know, once a month at least we have to have a forum like this one and we examine and follow up the findings and conclusion of the study. Uh, there are uh, uh, some recommendations, but of course uh, this recommendation is just drawn out of the uh, stuff that I have mentioned, but I would like to conclude by saying uh, I thank this opportunity for talking about the uh, role of media and uh, climate uh, and climate change and uh, I want to thank the organizers once again uh, and I hope uh, you allow me to leave now uh, because I have another lecture to do with the University of California uh, so, if I don't have a question, uh, Nabil, uh, please allow me to leave. And I thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Professor Amin, for this very important, uh, educative and uh, concise uh, PowerPoint presentation, which actually tackles a very important issue, which is the publicity of this process. Well, I heard about cl myself, I heard about climate change about 20 years ago. But actually, I didn't believe in it. Why? It, 
I'm a scientific person. I didn't believe that it will come. But in the developed countries, they used to speak about this directly in a very um, overt and important as a very overt and important topic. We didn't in I mean in the Arab countries and I'm mainly I'm speaking about Egypt is that it is not propagated in the uh, daily education. We do not believe as normal persons that climate change is going to happen. And this climate is not just a temperature fall or rise up or a, or a decrease. No, it affects all the aspects of life. So, Professor Amin, uh, thank you very much for asking to have climate change in entertainment program, to be part of the children educative programs, to be propagating in the community in a very proper way and in an attractive way also, and to try to emphasize this, that it is something which is going to change the life. It's going to uh, either alleviate poverty or, I mean, it can change the style of life of the people. Uh, also, I can have from this talk that Professor Amin is asking for regular forums addressing this. And may also it can be directed in, in simpler words to uh, media professionals to be more interested in covering such topics. Uh, thank you, Professor Amin, again. And thank we are you. going to have to take your advice and move forwards with this. Uh, if we don't have any questions for Professor Amin, we are Dr. sorry Hino, to have Hino. him leaving. But of course, thank you for giving I, this time for us. I, I, any I, questions I, for Professor I Amin? Read. I will wait for five minutes for any questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Ahmed. There was uh, one raised, uh, hand raised by Mr. Shiraz Hassan. Mr. Shiraz, if you can quickly ask your question uh, to Professor. Professor just... Hussain, thank you very much for uh, giving this opportunity. My name is Shiraz Asnad and I am working in Pakistan and I do cover climate as well. <laughs> last, three, last year, I was a part of Oxford University Climate Journalism Network and that was quite an eye-opening for me. Whatever the conclusion and whatever the problem you are sharing literally, I just mentioned in, the, in my chat as well that it's all seen that that's all happening, not at your side or Arab side, that's also happening at the Asian side as well. Sir, how do we increase that, you know, curiosity among the journalists regarding the climate issues? Because in Pakistan is one of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the top-notch country which is suffering from the climate change. So how we can bring this uh, climate issues into the journalists to consider that as their top-notch priority? Thank you. Uh, again, uh, this is a very uh, uh, wonderful uh, platform that we can exchange uh, thoughts and ideas uh, with regard to what's happening in, in Egypt and in other countries uh, based on studies. You know, these are uh, part of my responsibility. I'm, I'm uh, the, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the editor of the uh, of. Uh, of a Q3, Q2, now Q3, but we're coming back again to Q2, uh, that I have to gather information from different parts of the, uh, from Arab societies. And I have also the Arab uh, US uh, Association for Communica Communication uh, Educators, where we can ask questions to a lot of scholars uh, and professors in universities. So that's why I'm uh, limiting the, the findings of my presentation to the Arab world, uh, with particular reference, of course, to Egypt. However, uh, it is important what we have said. What you have said is very important, and uh, 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 it is, again, uh, an invitation to have a, a, a short summary or a monograph uh, that's coming out of this wonderful platform uh, regarding you know, the status of the media with regard to uh, climate change, hunger and poverty, and environmental issues. Uh, this, uh, are, as I said before, I'm, 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 I'm willing uh, to put my, uh, my uh, journal uh, in uh, if, it is a, if, it, if the organizers think that it's a good recommendation that we do uh, more one specialized issue or a special issue on uh, media, uh, poverty, uh, 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 hunger, and climate change. And we invite all of, uh, as a primary uh, researcher, those who are uh, been into this particular uh, conference uh, to 
give us more information about their presentations or dig for more information or present papers. And then I, I will do a call for papers for the rest of the world, you know, because it's not limited only to uh, Arab and Islamic world. So uh, this, this, is, this is going to be my contribution because I feel I, I want to be contri contributing to this platform. I, I have attended the, 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 the uh, Cup uh, 27 uh, and 28 in German Sheikh and, uh, and UAE, but again, my presentation is something and making my friends and my colleagues and the, uh, the academic world aware of uh, certain problems, but I, I cannot go behind as uh, without collective efforts uh, so that we can really bring these thoughts uh, and ideas and sharpen it and present it to our countries and our world so that we make a meaningful change for the future. Uh, well, another minute, Professor Amin, for just one question again, okay? Sure. Uh, please, yes. I'd like to, to ask you, Professor, if there is any pe peculiarity cases of climate issues synonymous in Africa that you can share with us, for example, like challenges, prospects, etc. In Africa? Yes. Or in North Africa? Well, the question is Africa as a whole. Oh, uh, in Africa, of course, uh, I, uh, there is uh, big changes in African media. And uh, ever since uh, uh, the conference that was held in 2010 in Kenya, and we address climate change issues in this conference, uh, and was uh, actually endorsed by six president, uh, African African countries president, and uh, uh, some uh, scholars. I was one of them. But again, it, this was a key, uh, an eye opener for me because I I was not really looking into this direction. I was looking into media systems. Uh, and how to establish, uh, uh, you know, media, uh, solid media systems in Africa. But we have a conference, and this conference is still lives since 1998 until now, a yearly conference, which is a Africa Highway, uh, which is only, uh, you know, I, I, we talk about issues in different groups uh, and different divisions. And uh, one of the groups and divisions is has to do with uh, climate change and environment in Africa. I also uh, held like uh, maybe 60 African uh, workshops, uh, African journalist workshops uh, in my center uh, since 1992 and until now, uh, where we have uh, African uh, journalists coming for intensive training uh, and one of the uh, items that we always address has to do with environment and uh, climate change. So I guess this, th there are some efforts that I, 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 I don't follow up with uh, all the graduates who have been awarded certificates, uh, but I know I'm, and I met many of them in different African nations and they are leading uh, some very important uh, media outlets. Yeah, I have many friends in Nigeria, for example, and South Africa, and many uh, and many other African. And you know, you know that right now is the African Cup, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, football is bringing the African nation. They don't know it. They are they know the competition, and they, oh, they, we lost from this country. But actually, what's happening? is bringing the African nations together and talking about something in common. I wish this in common is climate change. <laughs> Hoping for this also. Thank you, Professor, yeah. for your valuable time. And it was Thank really a rich, a rich presentation. And uh, we are going to follow up and we'll keep everything in track, as you've said. Now we Thank are you. going to move to uh, Miss uh, Sunata Ragu.
the executive producer of Scrolling in India. She is going to speak about theoretical learnings from COP28 to reporting from the grassroots. But before that, I'm going to give you a very short hint about her. Well, she has executively produced over 20, 200 short documentaries on climate change and environmental sustainability. As a bilingual TV presenter, she has also anchored Echo India in English and Hindi for audiences worldwide. Well, she is the, uh, an award-winning journalist, journalist and a television producer with over 13 years of experience. Since 2016, she has built, shaped, and scaled Scroll in Digital, which is a digital video newsroom, actually. Creating news and news products for, pro for platforms with about 6 million to 200 users. Of course, this is a remarkable number. So please, Ms. Sonata. Thank you for Hello. having me. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you good are. Good day. Having me. <laughs> good day. Good day is a good way to put it. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. So we're here to talk about, uh, I'm going to repeat a lot of what... Um, you know, uh, Professor Amin has already said, uh, but hopefully we will start with context and then we will go into how to bring some of those theoretical things that we learned about at COP28 about food systems uh, into journalism practice. Right. So what I'm hoping to achieve from the 10-15 minutes that follow is a quick refresher on the link between global greenhouse emissions and human activities. Uh, the second thing is how food and food systems were addressed in COP28 and how to bring this into your reportage. So let's do a quick refresher first. So in uh, the IPCC report, uh, the sixth assessment report that came out in uh, mid-2023, for the first time, uh, the scientists have gone on record to say that human activities have unequivocally caused climate change. Right. Uh, Scientists have taken their time ever since the IPCC was formed about 35 years ago. Scientists have taken their time to actually find research, find scientific evidence to say this, to use this word unequivocally. Right. Earlier, what have they said? They have said the warming of the climate system is unequivocal, uh, but we don't know about human activity. We've said global G uh, greenhouse gas emissions are due to uh, human activities and have grown. There's been an increase, but the use of unequivocal is not there. Right? Human influence on climate system is clear. Clear, again, is a vague word. Uh, warming of this climate system is unequivocal, but again, nothing about human activity. What I'm trying to say here is, till 2023, which is last year, scientists uh, who have contributed to the IPCC reports uh, have not essentially said that uh, there is unequivocal connection between human activities and uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. But in 2023, that did happen. That means they have taken their time to say that climate change is real, global greenhouse gas emissions are leading to climate change, right? So if you go next uh, to the next slide, what they have gone on to iterate, reiterate, is there's a near linear relationship between how much carbon dioxide we burn and with human activities, right? Uh, <coughs> so this again makes it very, very clear that every ton of carbon dioxide emissions is adding to uh, global warming and that could, you know, cause problems for us, for the generations that follow us, right? Now, talking about food systems, how do we bring this into food systems, right? The way we grow, ship, cook, dispose, and sometimes waste food contributes to about one third of all global greenhouse gas emissions, right? That's what we're here to talk about today, SDG 2, which is zero hunger. But the way we grow, ship, as in transport food from one region to another, cook, dispose, and sometimes waste food, contributes to one third. And this is a very, very large number, right? So having that as the context, what did COP28, which was, uh, you know, the conference of parties uh, conference that, that was held uh, in, in December of last year, uh, that was COP28, what did, how did food systems figure in this, right? So historically, negotiations and impacts about food systems have been excluded from global climate negotiations. Right. 
Uh, but COP28 was different. Uh, more than 150 countries have signed a declaration on sustainable agriculture and almost, you know, officially acknowledging that sustainable agriculture is part of responding appropriately to climate change. That means if we are to respond appropriately to climate change, uh, sustainably carrying out agriculture, sustainably producing food, sustainably shipping food, sustainably preserving food, and all of this is part of addressing climate change and part of addressing climate change appropriately. Right. The second thing that came up at uh, COP28 was uh, a food systems uh, roadmap was set up by the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is it was called Achieving SDG 2 without breaching the 1.5 degree threshold, a global roadmap. So that was laid out by the FAO. Now, both these uh, documents, essentially, right, the declaration especially is not legally binding. So while 150 countries may have said that, look, we have the intention of uh, tying sustainable agriculture to our climate change goals, but it's not legally binding yet, right? The parties are making their own intention known to integrate plans for resilient and sustainable food systems into their climate uh, climate plans. The intention is uh, what was achieved at uh, the second thing, the second document that was signed, which is the, the FAO roadmap, lists some very specific things that could be done so that the 1.5 uh, degrees breach does not occur. So those uh, specific uh, you know parts of the roadmap were cutting methane emissions from livestock by 25%. Again, uh, you know, a huge uh, goal. And this was very, very significant. Having food waste emissions by 2030. Now, remember, this has not been officially put into uh, a declaration or a roadmap earlier. So this is these were huge, uh, you know, improvements uh, compared to the last COPs and the last climate negotiations that have happened over the last, you know, many decades. The third one was growing a more biodiverse range of crops than the world currently relies on. So you're clearly seeing a step away from monoculture. You're clearly seeing a step away uh from from you know from growing only cash crops and looking at moving towards a more biodiverse range of crops so these were the things that happened with regard to food systems at cop 28 now the other big tussle the tug of war that was happening is uh there were a record number of lobbyists present at cop 28 right uh, so what they were saying essentially is that you know because of the production uh, and the chains we have, we are ensuring food security. So be it the meat lobby, be it the uh, big agri lobby, be it the, the dairy lobby, all of them uh, essentially are saying that uh, we are ensuring food security for a growing planet, you know, for 8 billion people, for when we reach 10 billion people, we need to grow food. So which is why we need land, which is why we need more food production capacity. So that's where they are coming from. On the other hand, sustainable agriculture is saying we are overdoing it. We need to do it sustainably, you know, just because we need to build, um, you know, a farm doesn't mean we raise away forests or, you know, just because we need to build a, a dairy ranch doesn't mean we just wipe out forests and create that in that state. In, in its place, right? So this tug of war between food security and sustainable agriculture was also sort of uh, very evident uh, in uh, in COP28 this time. So having had all this context, right? We've talked, we've spoken about um, global greenhouse gas emissions, its connection to uh, to human activities. We've seen what COP28 um, said and did about food systems. Let's look at some starting points uh, in bringing these complex concepts uh, about food systems and climate change into constructive in, into constructive journalism, right? So these are again, you know, suggestions that have worked for me. Uh, they may not work in all contexts, but these are really, really good uh, starting points, especially when you're dealing with uh, very, very complex scientific terminology, right? So the first one which I would suggest, if you're reporting from the field, if you're going out there 
uh, on the ground to speak to people make sure you have a ready reckoner in a language of your interviewee or a user what do i mean by this right a lot of the complex terms that we come across you know i'm speaking to you in english i have read the ipcc report in english uh, the ipcc reports the very very scientific uh you know heavy knowledge in that is accessible in all un languages but not necessarily in every language that uh that in in the context that we operate in right uh, so we have we have people from um, from vietnam here from indonesia here from parts of africa here uh, the formal un languages may not work uh, or, or may not be accessible in those so what what you can do is is first figure out the language of how you're going to communicate some of these very very complex words so as you can see this is something that i'm building for uh, for indian languages and for for our reporters uh, this is basically a glossary again given by the ipcc uh, it's a standard glossary of all the climate change terms that that are usually used uh, in in all reports in all scientific reports how do you communicate this to the common user the common audience right how do you make it more accessible to them things like aerosol right a lot of the times you know what if you understand english you know what aerosol means but to translate that into a language that a uh, uh, an end user might understand or your interviewee may understand is going to take some effort on the journalist's part to break it down and, and unravel it themselves and then communicated to others so something like this will really really help you to make sure that the people you are speaking to will understand these complex scientific terms so in in the context of food systems for example this uh, phrase called afolu which is agriculture forestry and other land use gets used a lot how do you say that in your language right afforestation gets used a lot deforestation gets used a lot direct agricultural emissions these words get used a lot how do you say this in your language so that the person at the other end is able to understand it so this would be uh, my first starting point the second is and this is very very interesting especially because of the times we live in today right what are your users searching for online about food and climate change in your particular region right especially in uh, you don't have to go worldwide uh, like you know uh, professor amin was also saying that you know you need to find a way to localize your story you need to address your particular audience so how do you find out what your users are searching for and this is a resource if you have a pen and paper close to you please note it down uh oh sorry let me let me give the context to what i'm going to show you first so the the tool that i'm going to show you is essentially based on this statistic which is 91% of all searches online or 91.6% of all searches online come from google search right and this as you can see the date is january 2023 to 2024 so this is the latest data the other searches are not uh as sort of uh you know they are not used as much but google search is something that people 91.6% of the people use even as of today right so with the context of this data let's move to this tool called answer socrates so what does answer socrates do if you say food plus climate change in and if if you google answer socrates you will find it so if you google food uh, if if in the search bar if you say food plus climate change you put in your target country for me it's india i put in my target language which is english it's combining all the things that people search on google with regard to food plus climate change and gives you what they are searching for that means there are people sitting at the other end who are curious about these questions with regard to food and climate change so if you go into sort of the you know the the if you if you drill down into each one of these people are act actually asking how does food affect climate change how does food impact climate change how can food affect climate change you know these are the various sort of permutations and combinations of word of words that people are using to actually search on google uh when it comes to food and climate change this of course i've i've given in the query of food plus climate change this you can use across your journalism practice for anything that you're trying to find out right if you're if you're doing 
any story this is going to be very helpful just to understand the pulse of your audience just to understand the pulse of your region what are they actually searching for you know and what can you address can you answer those questions can you make sure that uh, your reportage your journalism helps them answer some of those questions that they are searching for right so answer socrates is a free tool uh and you know you're there there are a lot of paid tools available as well but this is a free tool and you're able to use it uh quite easily so that's the second one that's the second starting point the third starting point would be to explore the multi dimensionality of your story right and again you know professor amin has kind of already uh touched upon this a little which essentially means that every beat is a climate beat right uh a lot of us while it's true that uh you know climate change does not get the coverage uh that it should get you know people are calling it the biggest crisis of our generation people are calling it uh, a very very important thing that we need to look at but we are not really paying attention to but you can cover climate change with any beat in your news organization right so currently we have combined climate change and food but you are able to tack on uh, livelihood to it you are able to tack on health to it you can tack on you know poverty to it social justice governance law gender business and economy energy transportation all of these are uh, uh can be attached and can be made into a climate change story right so you don't necessarily have to go out there and say you know or pitch your story as a climate change story you can always say that i'm working whatever your organization's preferences so some organizations you know specifically work on education specifically work on poverty more specifically work on gender more so you can always tack climate change to gender you can always say i want to do a climate change but with with law uh, as the forefront so make sure that you're able to bring climate change into every story that you're that you do and it it is really possible and if you want if you want to brainstorm if you want any suggestions on how to take this forward uh i believe my contact details at the end of it please feel free to reach out to me and uh, you know i'm i'm happy to help right so these were the three things that uh i thought was would be helpful for you to make sure that complex systems can be sort of translated into constructive journalism this is again a quick recap of something that uh, again professor amin has already said but i want to reiterate because it 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 requires reiterating that make your relevant make your report relevant to the everyday lives of people experiences and passions a lot of the time we get caught only in numbers only in facts only in uh, you know statements made by uh, you know whoever is in power make sure that your audience understands that this is the biggest crisis of our generation what can they do about it make it relevant to their everyday lives right localize the story so if you talk about if i'm sitting i'm sitting in mumbai today if uh, if you tell me uh, or if you tell me or you know whoever is around me a story about a uh, city timbuktu uh I may be interested I may not be interested but if you tell me a story about Mumbai and how climate change is affecting my city my country it will have a little more impact in terms of what I can do about it so always localize your story center climate justice what this means is there are people there are inequalities inequities when it comes to climate change some people are affected more than others make sure that their stories are heard make sure that uh, you're able to center and and you know profile climate justice uh and make sure that their stories are heard right again like we've been saying know the science but talk like a real person right there are i think this this is taught to us in all our broadcast courses right from the beginning that there are going to be very very complex topics uh and in this case it would be the science but understand the science of course but try and find how you can talk like a real person like you're having a conversation with your friend how can you explain it say to a 12 year old to a 5 year old these complex concepts how do you break it down for them right so know the science talk like a real person tell the whole story including solutions again a lot of us are taught that 
you know we are meant to be skeptics we are not meant to uh, do pr for a particular company who's offering solutions we are not meant to uh, you know platform uh, a single uh, you know sort of a company that is doing something but you can you can provide a whole a sort of uh, you know the whole spectrum of solutions when it comes to uh, climate change and not only uh, you know the problems not only uh, what people are talking about but also how they are solving it right beware of greenwashing now this is a really really big one and especially in the era of social media especially in the age of esg uh, a lot of a lot of people a lot of companies a lot of governments a lot of organizations go out of their way to show how they are climate conscious conscious how they are doing such a great job on uh, climate change but when you dig two levels deeper it may not be the truth right always always beware of anybody claiming to do something fantastical anybody claiming to do something very big on climate change always dig two levels deeper and check what is the viability of this right treat activists like newsmakers again this is the thing that we are taught that you know don't be the activist uh, when it comes to climate change you know uh, in uh, when it comes to any any uh, field of journalism for that matter any subject in journalism don't be the activist it's not your you're just reporting the story right but uh, in this case sometimes we do tend to because there is science now we too tend to get uh, a little activisty but make sure that you treat activists also like newsmakers you're getting information from them and you're treating them like experts like newsmakers and getting context from them right they are not you don't become the activist but you treat activists as a newsmaker don't get spun again in similar uh, in in the same line as greenwashing and uh, activism which is a lot of lot of organizations will uh, will will pedal their narrative to you uh, make sure you're aware of the narrative make sure uh, you go into a conversation or you go into a journalistic exercise uh, aware that you know people are going like every direction from every direction you're going to get uh, a narrative and it's up to you to figure out what is uh, you know wh what what you want to say about this story right don't platform climate denialists which essentially this i've added this just now because there is scientific evidence that climate change is uh is is proven scientifically uh so there is no in in the bid to be neutral to all parties uh i don't think there is a necessity to uh give voice or give a platform to someone who's saying but climate change doesn't exist right it's okay to not platform uh climate change denialists pick your visuals carefully now what i mean by this and i've specifically added this is because heat this is an example but heat in india is very different to heat in the uk or heat in australia right the way we perceive these things uh as a society as a culture is very different heat in the uk for example is very welcome right uh it gives them uh, a respite from you know from all the cold months for example but heat in india is very very uh we don't want it right it's it you know we sweat we are in in we need to go out and work in the hot sun it's not the same the heat heat for us is not the heat. is not the same for the ones living in the uk right uh, so make sure you pick your visuals carefully so if you're sitting in a in a place like india for for a heat wave story for example don't don't use visuals of people basking in the sun right don't use visuals of uh people sunbathing uh, at a beach you know things like that so be very careful be very contextual about the images you're picking when it comes to uh when it comes to reporting on climate change and lastly i want to leave uh, you with this that whoever is going out to the field if you are editing if you are an editor if you are a, a video editor if you are a producer uh whatever whatever assembly line that you are in when it comes to broadcasting and working on climate change please take care of yourselves because this is very very grim news that we are consuming every day and it's first hand right so if you're editing a video if you are reporting on climate change from the ground 
if you're editing a copy make sure that you know you understand you empathize but you also distance yourself uh from all uh, the madness that is happening around you because as i've been told multiple times that it's only going to get worse right it's like for my generation i think we may just cut it off but for the generations that follow if we don't uh take some very very hard steps it is going to get worse so please take take care of yourselves uh when you're reporting on climate change right and yeah if you have any questions i'm available yes. at sanutha@scroll.in on email and uh i'm i'm at sanutha rago on linkedin you can uh, you can add me there and that's my talk thank you thank you very much miss sanutha for this informative uh, lecture or presentation Well actually I want to stress something here is that you emphasize the role of science communicators and science communication this is very important because I've told you I heard about this before 20 years ago and I didn't believe it even though I'm a scientific person but now it's a reality uh, for the time we are going to uh, to move now to Ms Afia Salam environmental communications consultant Pakistan she's going to be it's talking about food for thought But before, let me give a very short info, info about Ms. Afia. She's got four decades of experience in environmental journalism across print, electronic, and web platforms. She's also a seasoned journalist. And as a lead in FNF's International Academy of Leadership and Australia Awards Fellow, she is actually engaged and actively in various capacities, including her membership in POAN, the IUCN Commission on Education and Communications and Commission on Economic and Social Policy. She's committed to environmental issues and climate change and this is evident in her writings. She has also consistently shed, shed shedding light on these crucial matters. Beyond her journalistic endeavors, she actively advocates for environmental causes through seminars Uh, moderating panel discussions and round tables notably she serves as a member of the prime minister's advisory board the national climate change council further emphasizing her influence and involvement in shaping policies in her country related to environmental concerns so please miss afia carry on thank you very much to uh, nabil who contacted me on behalf of aibd and this is such an important and a very needed conversation that you are having over here uh i know that we are focusing on um, sdg 2 but i think the conversation we are uh, extends to all the sdgs as well as beyond the sdgs and this is why it's very important and while i have uh, focused because it was supposed to be on food and hunger Uh, on that in my presentation uh, you know all the points that were uh, made by all the three presenters preceding me were so on point but there's one thing i would like to flag over here uh, in the field of journalism especially in the context of journalism while not yet enough has been done to equip the journalists to be able to report on the science of climate change and how its nexus with all the other uh, you know impacts that are uh, Uh, that the world is facing and uh, the region that you have chosen is actually facing a lot more than others the the only segment of focusing attention on uh, uh, that is being uh, trained and uh, you know whose capacity is being built other reporters and uh, being in uh, journalism and being part of newsrooms and i can see some of my colleagues over here with whom i have worked over the years i feel that we also need to invest our energies and resources in um, maybe not training but at least sensitizing the gatekeepers of the media because the reporters they do the hard work they do the leg work in the field they go to people who are uh, you know knowledgeable they come up with a very good story but uh, the nature of the beast which is the media and this i uh, you know so many of the things that uh, dr ahmed was pointing i mean was pointing in the beginning resonated with me because we have the same issues here in pakistan from where i, I belong uh, that the focus of um, the media is not on the issues that we 
as a cohort or as a community, concerned community about climate change and SDGs and development and environmental degradation that are focused on because they don't see the light of day or they don't capture the attend the the headlines or the top news because the gatekeepers are not sensitized. Uh, and by the gatekeepers, I would uh, include the uh, those who assign the reporters to get the stories because the focus, like uh, was rightly pointed out, is either on the conflicts or on entertainment and sports, which are all very important, you know, that, that they are part of society and they are part of a normal society. But we are not really living in those normal times. The times require some kind of an affirmative action in which the, the climate change and environmental uh, conversation in the media needs to be centered. And it uh, the, the, the gatekeepers also include, obviously, the news directors at media channels and electronic media and the city editors or, uh, you know, the, 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 the editors themselves. So they know how important it is for the reporters to keep getting those kind of stories because that's what matters now. We, the, 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 the times you are living in require extra attention to be placed on these issues. So I just wanted to sort of flag this issue because right now not enough is being done to get into uh, get them into the fold of uh, the climate change conversation. So I just wanted to make this opening remark because this is not part of the presentation that I'm giving over here. But uh, this is why I deliberately didn't focus on the, calling the uh, my presentation as something related to agriculture or give a lot of figures. So there aren't many, many figures. I only want those conversation starters, which would connect uh, and hopefully resonate with different uh, segments of the population and especially the people who really are focused on uh, achieving those SDGs. Through, there is a predetermined route. There are these milestones. But, uh, you know, we are very close to the second half of uh, the compliances. 2030 now does not seem all that far away. And uh, like the MDGs, I don't think the world has moved fast enough for compl uh, complying or achieving all those goals. And I don't see it actually happening where we can tick market and said, OK, uh, goal two, done and dusted. But at least we still have to move towards it and even beyond 2030, because I, I don't see, you know, the uh, hunger being uh, completely wiped off the face of the earth. I wish. I could not be so despondent or negative about it. But the experience with the um, MDGs makes me a bit of a skeptic on that. So uh, next slide. This is just the title. <laughs> yeah, so this is something that, you know, I want to start with because we get into the second or the third or the fourth steps of where the conversation needs to start from. And I don't actually see that. This is a rhetorical question, basically. Can you see this? Next slide. And now can you see this? Now this is a lot more evident. And earlier this was just a blurred kind of a presence. Next. And this is how many people should be talking about the elephants. Next. And why the elephant? Because this is the elephant in the room people are not talking about. The pressure of the galloping population uh, which is adding billions after every few years and obviously there are with only finite resources on the planet earth means that this is something we also have to look at when we talk about the uh, question of hunger because when there are so many uh, competing uh, so then there will be some haves and there will be some have nots and the haves have to be more cognizant, they have to be more just and they have to be sharing or rather not using and uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very um, important uh, uh, thing to flag was a food waste. And if you look at so many reports, they speak about the availability of resources to be able to feed everyone right now. But not everyone being fed means that there is something Systemic, systemically problematic about the way the food is being distributed. So we need to speak of these things also. 
and uh, seemingly they don't seem to be a part of the climate change conversation but ultimately when the climate change impacts are going to have their uh, you know shrink those resources while the population is still galloping so the problems are going to be exacerbated now if this is just for my country but beyond these figures which should be alarming in uh, you know in themselves we or my country is part of a region which uh, harbors the quarter of humanity the number of people in pakistan india bangladesh china we are a quarter of humanity so this is why these kind of figures should uh, you know be ringing alarm bells continuously it shouldn't just be in a part of a report that you look you you know you sort of feel that you oh this you these are alarming figures and you feel aghast these need very very solid concerted efforts to reduce uh, the percentage of loss to productivity to to prosperity to just you know being able to exist next in a humane manner so like the, i mean this this entire discourse that we are having we cannot just pick uh, uh, sdg2 and think that if we achieve it we are done because all i think to to address sdg1 we actually have to go all the way to sdg7 because they are all interlinked and this is something also that i am not seeing a lot of you know the the uh, uh, intersection understanding of the intersectionality of all the issues and i was so happy to hear because i just before this webinar i'm coming out of a conversation a very similar conversation where i was saying that you know there are horses for courses and you don't necessarily have to use the word climate change to an audience that will uh, you know that will feel overwhelmed by that mention and trying to understand it you just use the language and the uh, the connotation which will tell them the story and this is something that the journalist i think need to work at the the uh, the uh, language in which it is being communicated the terms and technologies which are being uh, i will not use the word dumb down because simplification is different from dumbing it down but we need to make it understandable and that is also a challenge so the the glossary that you showed uh, 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 this similar work has happened in pakistan the, the glossary has been published in uh, in the urdu which is a national language as well as in regional languages but not they are not as widespread as they ought to be so then that means it's uh, uh, the uh, question climate change communication is an issue of education it's a health issue it's a justice issue it's a uh, you know it's a livelihood issue so all these things have to be seen holistically to be able to address even one of these goals completely so this is also a narrative that you know needs to get into the uh, uh the understanding of the journalist to who are trying to communicate climate change related issues i just want to only just uh, you know uh, nabil could you just uh, open this link and scroll down it obviously i'm not going to uh, read or uh, read off it so this is an article that i wrote about i think it was 5 6 7 years ago when this uh, are you able to open it uh, nabil yeah so this is what i titled it and just start scrolling you don't need I, i'm not going to read i'm just going to speak about it this is something or can you just stop at this image for a minute this is central punjab this is a belt which does not experience such kind of hail storm and there's a uh, so india pakistan bangladesh we are monsoon countries our agriculture is tied up to uh, the monsoon uh, season and it was uh, or the cropping pattern has been uh, for uh, for centuries um, you know being in uh, sync with the monsoon but this is something that happened around march and that is not the monsoon season monsoon is you know beyond may june july peters out around september uh, earlier in bangladesh and uh, india because it starts there earlier and uh, pakistan so this is what happened in march now the farmers were 
are absolutely taken uh, you know by surprise and their standing crop which would have been ready for harvesting in a, maybe a few weeks this is the state of the uh, crop uh, can you move uh, to the next images there so this is it this was standing crop just completely destroyed it destroyed the livestock feed and the size of the hail storm that uh, the hail uh, stones that fell even killed livestock because generally the farmers know around what time heavy rainfall will be there they have sheds where they take their livestock here the livestock was just roaming open because this is in the season they were expecting now this we thought was a freak occurrence you know in that in the year when this was published uh, can you just scroll on but this has been happening for the past 6 to 7 years continuously uh, uh you can uh, close the link uh, this is just i don't know how this has got pasted over here my resume so first the name given to this was pre monsoon for the next 2 to 3 4 years but then from here is where the neck there's a clear nexus of climate change happening because the timing of the rainfall the volume of the rainfall and the geography of this rainfall has changed and this means uh, can you bring uh, go back to the presentation to the slide now so these you know this all these are the warning signs of where the climate change is coming into play okay there's a typo over there being an editor i'm very ashamed of it uh so apologies for that but yes the changing precipitation first peer to people by surprise then the next 2 3 years they didn't think it would happen it happened again and now after 6 to 7 years of it happening there really is no excuse uh, could you go on the next one to not be able to uh, adapt to it uh, uh this should have happened and if it hasn't happened this should happen asap that there should be research and development on the crop substitution the timing the uh, uh, you know faster harvest of uh, the crops or uh, or to just say it in one line we need to climate proof for agriculture by research and development and uh, infusion of technology next slide i'll just race through it Uh, yes please and beyond the beyond the tangibles obviously there needs to be social safety nets because majority of the farmers are small uh, have small land holdings and uh, such crop losses you uh, just push them down the uh, uh, poverty line so there needs to be uh, farming alternate farming uh, crop insurance etc and social safety nets to just you know keep them uh, afloat next and again coming back to journalism the most of the things that i have said but so i would not restrict the advocacy to journalism streams only uh, these uh, need to be societal uh, communication tools with which this entire region has been familiar with so we need to communicate to our theater documentary films animation uh while not dumbing down but addressing the lowest common denominator so again you know know the audience and then uh, uh, tailor the communication accordingly <laughs> next i am going to the end of it so this is the objective next yes, and please. it's easier said than done but there's no getting away from it we have to find a way to address this issue next and this is this can be done if you put on the lens of climate justice because again it's a it's a resource haves and haves not thank you very much i'm available for any questions thank you very much miss afia for this informative pre presentation Uh, and please for just for the time we have to stick to the 15 minutes please okay, okay. we are going to move now to mr akin bod or we femi he is the executive director of corporate accountability and public participation in africa nigeria he is going to speak about the policy advocacy through media presenting a case study a very brief hint about uh, mr akin bod he has over Well, two decades of experience in grassroots organizing and this is important of course policy advocacy and building strong coalitions he was the deputy executive director of environmental rights action friends of the earth in nigeria nigeria foremost environmental rights advocacy group he also heads the, the era f e a e n s tobacco control and water campaign He has been involved in various capacities in tobacco control initiatives in the African region. He is the winner of the Bloomberg Award for Global Tobacco Control, which is of course well noted. He is 
on the board for several national and international nonprofit organizations. So please carry on. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, my apologies, I mixed up the time. I wasn't able to quickly do a slide. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to be speaking. Once again, my name is Oluwafemi Matiwa Kimbode. I must first introduce myself as a journalist. I practiced journalism for over 15 years before I also moved into um, environmental campaign. And um, I basically will be speaking about policy advocacy, particularly using the media. I uh, will be speaking as a journalist, as also as a media end user. Uh, with spe specific focus on, on Africa, and uh, I'll be speaking on the uh, team for today, which is Zero Hunger. Uh, and to say that, first, we need to know that Africa has a population of about 1.4 billion people. And the biggest problem is how to feed that continent. 95% uh, of agriculture in Africa depends on, on rainfall. Uh, Africa contributes less than 4% to global warming and yet the continent it's um, at the receiving end of uh, the impacts of climate change. About 23.4 million Africans are grappling with food insecurity, about 2.7 million children are malnourished. Um, there, there have been stories about the impact of climate change, extreme drought, uh, deforestation, flooding and the rest of them. Uh, well, the first thing is when we talk about advocacy and policy advocacy, what are you trying to, what are we trying to do? We are trying to mobilize people who have power, who have the resources to act uh, to continue to act in public good. Uh, we need their action. We need those policies that will protect all of us. Uh, and in, in that case, we need to develop our messages. We need to get those messages out. And there is is where the media comes in. And so then the most important connection, which is uh, media advocacy. And why do we uh, so much as advocates uh, need the media to move our message? Uh, it remains that the media provides credibility, uh, it provides leg uh, legitimacy as well as uh, visibility. Um, I often give the example of uh, Donald Trump. Please permit me, I'm not talking politics. Uh, he says a lot um, against the media, but the fact remains that when the media have anything uh, out, uh, Trump will be there to react in less than an hour, which means that is actually does uh, check what is in the media. We, we use the media uh, from even what uh, some of the presenters have said, not only to report as reporting news, but to, to set the agenda and shape debates across the world. Uh, we can, we, the, the media can no longer be bystander in issues that affect you know, the planet. Uh, and so it can be used as a, as a tool for Mobilize, uh, mobilizing people, and of course, in terms of propagating a uh, solution. So uh, we we have to recognize that we need to continue to use the media strategically uh, in order to make changes. And that led us to the issue of uh, climate change and COP28. Uh, one of the things we have uh, understand very much is that particularly from our continent africa the cop is reported from the point of an event uh you know the cop is happening this is this is what nigeria said this is what uh, what other countries said and we were deliberate in terms of how do we help journalists how do we help ourselves to take the cop from being reporting an event into an agenda setting uh, reportage. And I, I mean, the first thing we did was to organize training for uh, journalists from across the African region uh, on climate change. Because just like the presenters have said today, 
the languages of climate change sometimes can be deep and confusing. Uh, in order to get journalists to be more in-depth in reporting climate change and to be able to take that from the perspective of issues and some of the positive changes that we want to see at COP28. Now, if you, we could recall, one of the biggest uh, agenda of COP28 has been the issue of uh, loss and damage. And loss and damage is very critical to the African continent. As I said earlier, the continent is at the receiving end of the uh, end of the impacts of climate change. And so we also think that we have to be creative in our storytelling. Storytelling came up severally um, in the presentation here. Um, often uh, the fact that the way and the tools and the channels of reporting an issue can, in some cases, affect how people uh, receive our, our, our messages. And so we thought that uh, for the COP, it's, it's highly important that we began to tell the stories of frontline communities. Uh, we think that we cannot do justice to climate change reporting without uh, reporting how climate affects what you can call the ordinary people, the, the people at the front lines, the people whose livelihoods are affected, people who are suffering hunger as a result of um, climate change. And that when you go to COP, what you see there are government delegates who in most cases reside in city center. We need to, as journalists, be able to connect the sufferings of the locals with the policies that have been taken at our capitals, as well as at international engagements like, like the COP. And so the idea that we could also use a documentary came up. And we were looking at those strategic issues on the continent and communities that have been impacted on uh, it, to showcase the impact of climate change. People need to see to visualize the impact. Sometimes when you say people are impacted or they are affected by climate change, the fact remains that uh, it, sometimes it looks abstract. We need to be able to put real people, real life into those stories. And so we decided to do in County in Kele, in Cameroon, and Ayeto in uh, Ondo State, Nigeria. Uh, each of those countries have connections to issues. I mean, those communities have connections with issues we are debating today or discussing today. Most importantly, is Taveta County in in Kenya. Um, Taveta County has always been a very thriving agrarian community, uh, producing a lot of crop. As I said earlier, 95% of agriculture relies on rainfall on the continent. Uh, but uh, the Taveta County have not even seen rain for the past six months. Uh, and so the lands are dry and caked. Uh, and who no longer can feed themselves. Uh, you could see the picture of very dry and cooked farmlands. Communities that are just, you know, doing whatever to be able to feed because the land can no longer grow crops. Um, I know some of us have possibly read about the Eleno, Eleno phenomenon in Kenya. Uh, you need to visit those communities and you see them. And the sad story uh, we discover is that now, because they can no longer farm, the people again started digging into the ground to see whatever they can get from the ground. And they started digging for 
all manners of gemstones, creating gorges, and again further exacerbating the climate change crisis. That is the story of uh, Tabeta in, in, in Kenya. And why did we do this? We did this in order, as I said, to contribute to that discussion. Can you hear me? Okay, so we did this to contribute to that discussion that was going on in COP. The second community is a community uh, called Kambele in Cameroon. Kambele is a very mine, is a mining region, uh, mining for gold, which are sold in markets in the West. And then those golds don't even get back in terms of uh, adding to the resources of the local body, have their environment, vast area of, we did area short of land uh, already um, destroyed. And one thing about our stay in Kambele was that, I mean, the screen of our phones got destroyed right there in the car because of the heat of that particular environment, because it's the entire vast land is exposed. Uh, people who are interested in those stories to check out. People die almost all the time from those kind of mines. I think there's another one in, in Mali recently where about 80 people die. Uh, and also, because of our time, I'll just quickly go to Nigeria. The story of the Niger Delta in Nigeria is the story of big oil transnationals and local communities. There is a community called Ayetoro. Uh, please, if you have the time, Check, check the documentary and you find out that um, Ayetoro is a short line, living peacefully, it's an historical line with, you know, community um, structures and system that worked um, until uh, one oil company is, you know, landed by their shore and uh, trouble started. As of today, over 70% of that community is already taken over by, you know, the uh, surging ocean and the communities are crying for help their children can no longer go to school the schools are actually submerged and uh, the rest of them now as i said earlier why did we do the documentary we did the documentary to visualize the problem to assist in the debate that was growing up at the cop we screened that documentary in four major events. Uh, some major international institutions, at, at, that's at the COP. That documentary in itself has generated close to 50 media reports in Nigeria and outside. Some international uh, agencies came and asked for it. Uh, as a result of that documentary, local governments uh, here in Nigeria are beginning to, to now take action and promising to address, let's say, the problem of climate change. I mean, and Osan Church. In Cameroon, for instance, uh, the government over there has issued statement again over the issue of landmines. So what we do, and we can do as journalists, is to help to connect local impact of climate change with the local governments, with the national government, as well as the international um, discussions. And the issue of how we tell our stories uh, matters a lot. How we break down our stories for people to understand. A creative way of using the media can lead into a lot of greater uh, successes. Uh, I often say this, that there is a time that the media itself it's also a part of what we talking in terms of transformative change. And so the media cannot be a bystander. The, the media for the, the results and the solution that we need. Um, I, again, didn't um, do a slide, so I will probably take a pause here, I uh, you know I've just taken a slice of my time and then take the rest to take questions. Please, you can go 
on YouTube and take a very close look at that documentary. And that will tell you much about these linkages that we're talking about that look, there is a direct linkage between climate change, hunger, agriculture, and local livelihoods. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this informative speech. Even without slides, it was informative and very nice. And actually, you stick to the time. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Well, actually, I to conclude this, we are coming to the end of this webinar. So please, if there are any questions to be posed to the, to the speakers, kindly put in the chat box and we will uh, carry it on to the speaker. Before we have the group photo, the virtual, of course, and the remarks and the closing remarks. Wants to share any any case study? I believe that we have friends from Pacific as well, from especially from Fiji. If they want to say something about their situation, you're more than welcome. And then we have uh, some uh, colleagues from landlocked areas as well. So their case studies would be an interesting one as well. Well, actually, it uh, I can say that this webinar is uh, is productive is important. We brought people from different disciplines. We engaged Egypt, we engaged different countries in, in Africa. We had the, the Asia Pacific with us also. And of course, this is an added value for the webinar. And uh, what we can conclude or what I concluded from this is that we need to, uh, to embed climate change in our daily life, to educate people and the grassroots and the community about climate change, it is, as we've said, it is not just a rise or a decrease in the temperature, but it affects the, the whole life. And it's actually uh, having an impact on our daily activities and, uh, and the welfare of the humanity as a whole, if it is represented in smaller communities. Well, this is actually what I can say that we drew from this webinar. Thank you. And now I'll be moving towards the second page. And three, two, one. Thank you very much. Uh, just for the reference that, uh, as I mentioned, that the month of February would be all about radio for AIBD and AIBD will be uh, hosting uh, its annual web summit on radio uh, uh, radio and uh, uh, the, its corresponding theme, which is the uh, a century informing of a century of informing, entertaining, and educating. yes, enlightening and informing, yes. and educating the three and issues. <laughs> again, for AIBD members, we are also uh, going to announce the next year, the next year's theme uh, for a world uh, for AIBD International Awards for Radio, Television, and Sustainability. All right. So okay, and also we are going to participate in the radio uh, day with or in the radio month, which is going to start on February, and we hope that we can collaborate also and try to spread this among our uh, broadcasting uh, uh, countries. Uh, I'm really happy with the collaboration with AIBD and looking forwards for more and more uh, of these events, uh, as it is actually uh, informing and helping all our media personnel to to deliver what actually endangers human beings. So thank you very much. I think we can close the, the uh, session now. And uh, thank you everyone for joining, especially the speakers on behalf of AIBD Secretariat and uh, Ms. Philomena Niana Prakasam, our Secretariat Director and CEO. Uh, and uh, do stay in touch with us via our Facebook group and also LinkedIn as well. And also we'll be uploading, uploading some new episodes on TV AIBD as well, where you can find some interviews with uh, like top notch media intel intelligentsia and media moguls as well. So do subscribe to TV AIBD if you haven't done so. And thank you very much and see you all very soon.